Thank you, Barry, for that introduction, and thank you, Governor Dukakis, for the invitation to participate in this uh, really interesting uh, session. This is a project that uh, uh, I've been interested in for a long time, not quite as long as Barry suggested. <laughs> I thought for a moment when Barry was going into the, to the introduction that it was one of my children uh, who was uh, going to be uh, continuing this discussion because I'm always being accused of being much older than I am. But uh, I would like to really focus on the issue, if we can move this forward. We're moving. Okay. We're right here. I'd like to talk about an issue that not only I've been concerned about uh, for a very, very long time, but not only everyone in this room, I think everybody in this country now recognizes that we are in the worst crisis in the labor market since the Depression. And not only that, that's bad enough that we have experienced this crisis. The problem is we aren't getting anywhere in addressing this crisis. And I think we need a much stronger, much more proactive, much more focused effort to address this set of issues, to rebuild the jobs that we have lost through the last recession, and to build high quality jobs that we have lost now for over 30 years in this country. And so the proposal that I want to lay on the table and discuss with you tonight is something that I'll call a jobs compact. That is an approach that tries to get all of the key parties, certainly the business community, not just individual businesses, but the business community to act as a community, to work with those of us in education, to work with the labor movement, and to move the government in a progressive way so that we can start to address these issues systematically. And so what I'd like to do is to spend a little bit of time just talking about the context. I don't need to spend a lot of time going over the numbers and the pictures. Uh, because we all know the, the, the situation that we're in, but I want to paint it as clearly as I can first so that we understand the depth of the problem and the two dimensions of this problem. Because many people talk about the lack of jobs, but we don't have enough discussion in this society today or enough momentum in asking how do we not only regain the jobs, but how do we make sure that they are quality jobs. And so uh, those two dimensions will lay out and then let's talk about what we might do about it. Now, we've avoided <coughs> addressing these issues because there's such a strong political impasse in Washington and because the business community is essentially sitting on its hands and not investing in a way that will help us to rebuild the economy uh, that we need. And because the labor movement is so <coughs> paralyzed in its own decline that it doesn't have the capacity to support the kind of innovations that we're talking about. But we also have 30 years of really progressive ideas, innovations at the local level, progressive companies, individual workplaces, individual training programs, individual programs like this in education that bring the community together to talk about issues, progressive labor management relations partnerships around the country. And we can build in the good old American way, the way we have always made social progress in this country, by first identifying what's going on at the local level, by building from state level innovations like Barry and I are hoping we can uh, do here in Massachusetts in education, and then move to the national level. So it's that approach that I think we need uh, to take uh, forward. I think there's also good news that people are beginning to recognize this uh, as part of a, what, at, at MIT we have meetings at Northwestern, uh, Northeastern here you have uh, open classrooms. At Harvard they have summits. So, that's part of the competitiveness summit that brought CEOs and, and other illustrious leaders together to talk about what should we do to rebuild the economy and to build it in a way that promotes a higher standard of living in the United States. And the CEOs who came to that, and the most powerful business leaders in the country were there. And to a person, they began to understand the depth of the problem and saw jobs as the current uh, immediate crisis that needed to be and so I think there's a readiness in the business community, and God knows there's a readiness in the American public to deal with this. And yes, we have an election coming. Not much good is going to happen between now and November. But I am hoping that uh, as a result of getting these issues on the table, 
that there will be an opportunity to move forward after the election. And if uh, God's willing, perhaps we will have uh, enough momentum to put pressure on our elected leaders to move forward. So that's the idea. So let me uh, talk a little bit about the dimensions of the jobs crisis. And let me use one crazy diagram <laughs> to illustrate the depth of the problem. It, you can ignore or just glance at that cobweb that looks like a V of about uh, five or six different colors. Because what we're pro projecting here are the percentage of jobs lost in, re in the last five recessions prior to this one. And then how long it took, how many months it took to regain those jobs. And what you see is sort of a V. Uh, yes, we lost a lot of jobs, and then not so slowly, but uh, a robust recovery, with the exception, perhaps, of the, the purple one that is 2001, sort of the second worst looking line. The most recent recession took longer, and we essentially just about got back to uh, where we were, and then the uh, great uh, re uh, recession hit us again. But look at where we are today with the recession that started in 2007 and continues now well in, uh, in uh, two years later. We are nowhere close to regaining those jobs. And in fact, basically, we're still over 5 million jobs short of the jobs we lost, plus the growth in the labor force. And the President's <coughs> Jobs and Competitiveness Council has done a calculation, which I agree with, and I've validated in a variety of different ways, that what we really need in this country is we need about 20 million new jobs over the rest of this decade to get back to where we were and to make up for the labor force growth that has occurred since then. So the jobs compact that I believe we need has to be a long run, one that's going to be sustained over a period of time that can get us those 20 million jobs by 2020. We are not going to get out of this hole uh, in the short run. We're not going to get out of this hole in the next four years of a presidential administration, even with progressive policies. This is going to take concerted, proactive effort over the rest of this decade. Right now, what are we creating? Well, we're creating about uh, 100,000 jobs a month. That's only about 30,000 less than we need to keep up with the growth in the labor force. And so each month, we are still falling farther behind in closing the jobs deficit. Meanwhile, our young people, experience about uh, with college graduation, either 50% uh, are, are unemployed or underemployed, working in jobs that don't utilize their skills. Our elderly who are laid off are likely to never get rehired at any jobs other than maybe a greeter at Walmart or the equivalent of some part-time job. And those people who suffer from long-term unemployment have a whole series of social and economic effects that last the rest of their life and affect, last and affect their families and their children. Higher divorce rates, higher suicide rates, higher mortality for people who are in long-term unemployment and lower educational achievement for their children. And so the social and economic consequences of living with this kind of unemployment are severe, long-lasting, and uh, will not go away if we don't address them. But I want to talk about a second dimension because I said we need to worry about the quality of jobs as well as the quantity of jobs. Since 1980, we have had what I and many others have called a broken social contract in the United States. If you go back and you look at this very simple diagram that shows what was the state of the economy from the 1940s, from about 1945 right through uh, the 1970s, you see those three lines three different colored lines all moving together. Those lines measure, the red line measures productivity, labor, labor productivity in the economy. Uh, the middle uh, sort of darker line, purple, measures family income, and the blue line measures uh, average hourly earnings for wage and salary workers. And you saw that we had a social contract that if people contributed and we improved the economy through growth and productivity, our institutions were strong enough and our, our, our labor force practices and policies and human resource policies in organizations were strong enough to allow workers and their families to capture their fair share and wages and productivity moved together. Something happened around 1980 and maybe a little bit before that where those lines now diverge and continue to diverge 
where productivity has grown by about 80% since 1980, uh, family income has grown by about 12%, uh, and average hourly earnings has grown by about 6%. There's something wrong with an economy that doesn't allow the workers who contribute to improving the performance of the economy to share in the, the benefits of it. And so when we get Occupy Wall Street noticing that the top 1% got 58% of the growth of, of income since the 1970s, it's a reflection of this problem. We've got to find a way to rebuild a social contract in the United States. And we could go on and, and look at other evidence beyond wages and look at the loss of our basic pension plans. That green line is a <coughs> shows the decline in defined benefit plans that we've experienced uh, since 1980. And the orange or line shows the growth in the 401k or defined contribution plans, but the problem is that as we lose the defined benefit plan and replace it with these 401 savings plans, we're not recouping and maintaining the, the income security that is needed for people to retire with dignity. And in fact, even the Wall Street Journal uh, estimates that those people who just have 401k plans now will be about $30,000 on average short on an annual income replacement basis to, to get to the, about the 70 or 70% 70 number of, or, or range of income that they need relative to what they had when they were working. So we are recreating a problem we had solved. The governor's generation helped solve the elderly poverty problem by having strong pensions and good social welfare programs and strong unions that helped to get us there and policies that ensured that we could retire with dignity. Our generation now and the next generation, our generation will be the benefit of it. The next generation is going to pay the price for the lack of that. Uh, and we will again have an elderly group that uh, is suffering from lack of adequate uh, income and a dignified uh, uh, period of Young people in particular are paying a price. This is a, 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 a graph that shows the decline in job satisfaction, the steady decline since the 1980s. So now, less than 50% of American workers say they, are, they have, are satisfied with their jobs and their work, and the biggest dissatisfaction is not with the nature of the work. They like what they do, but they don't feel that they are being adequately compensated. And their job security, their opportunities for training and development and learning those are the things that are depressing job satisfaction. And which group is, is declining the most? People in this room who are under the age of 25 because of the lack of opportunities. So these are the challenges we face. So let's ask them, how do we get here? And then let's talk about what we might do. Now, as, as a, a good academic, I'm used to doing all kinds of crazy, fancy analyses of a particular problem and identifying a particular cause and control for all sorts of other things. That's not what I'm going to talk about here. Yes, globalization. Yes, technological change. Yes, the decline of unions. All of that has a, 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 a piece of this problem. But I think the root problem, the root cause of the problem, is that we have allowed the American corporation to turn into a financial engine. Rather than an engine or an, an instrument for building prosperity in the country, for building returns to shareholders, to returning uh, some of those returns to employees and to their communities. Instead, it's the shareholder value maximization paradigm that took place starting in the 19, uh, late 1970s, took off in the 1980s with uh, new financial instruments and hostile takeovers and leverage buyouts and the deregulation of our financial institutions and the takeover of business schools like mine with finance as the dominant force in our education of the next generation of managers. You're there to maximize shareholder value. Now what does that do? It takes more of our talent into the financial sector and away from the goods producing sector. It, take, it takes the emphasis on the responsibility of the firm to multiple stakeholders out of the equation because finance, the financial markets dominate and finance within the corporation dominates and it dominates the discourse. Just look at the 24-7 dominance of financial news on cable TV today. What that has done is the net uh, effect of that is it's narrowed down the interests of the firm. And so there's a bigger d divide today 
between the interests of the individual corporation and the interests of both the business community, written <coughs> broadly and large, and the interests of the nation. And so no individual firm is likely to be able to say, in the face of shareholder pressure, I will take on the challenge of starting to build a robust and sustainable economy and do all the things that are needed to get the standard of living growing again in the United States. Yet the whole business community shares a, a need and an interest in seeing that happen. 60% of the multinational corporations in the United States still, re they rely for 60% of their revenue on American markets and American <laughs> sales. That means we need a strong purchasing power. We need a robust economy. But what's holding us back is that the individual firms can move their operations abroad. They can pursue the lowest common denominator. And so the individual firms don't share that collective interest. That's a market failure in economic terms. And there are simple ways to solve economic failures, or market failures, and that is by working together, by collaborating, by having coordinating mechanisms, whether it's labor that helps to coordinate across firms, whether it's uh, business associations, or whether it's the government. We need some mechanism to coordinate across businesses to work together to pursue their common interests so we don't have a tragedy of the commons just perpetually. That, I think, is the root cause of why we are stuck in this uh, uh, low-wage equilibrium that I think we are, are, are now suffering from. And so we need to address uh, that particular issue. But there's another problem. Not only is there a market failure, but we also have a, an institutional failure, a mismatch between the labor market institutions we find in the United States today and the needs of the American modern economy. We've moved to a more knowledge-based economy where college education, technical training are essential, but we're not keeping up with the needs of this economy by providing the kind of labor force that is ne needed today. Unions have declined. Unions that, that got bargaining power by trying to take wages out of competition, by organizing big parts of the market, by using the pressure of the strike to get improvements in their conditions, those kinds of unions have gone away, they are so weak, they can't do anything about it, and they're not coming back in that image and re trying to reproduce unions in that image or collective bargaining in that image is not going to be successful. We've got to modernize the labor management system, and I'll talk about that uh, briefly uh, before we finish, but we've got to find a new way to draw on innovation as a source of power, to draw on knowledge as a source of power to draw on the ability to create value and share that value in organizations as the ba basic objective of national labor policy and the basic objective of labor relations on the ground between companies and unions. Government has retreated. I don't need to re uh, 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 go through this full list, but in the 1960s and the 1970s, government tried to have a balanced wage policy where there were wage norms that supported this social contract with deregulation, with the reduction in enforcement, with the backing away from labor policy, with a broken labor law. We don't have a government labor policy at the moment, and there's no prospect for getting one uh, at, in, in this political environment. We need to find a new way to build a labor policy through a better dialogue between the parties. So how do we move forward? Well, with this dismal uh, picture, uh, my wife uh, accuses me of being the patron saint of lost causes. <laughs> but I believe that there is a way forward. And I believe with the kind of engagement of people like all of the people in this room, in this community, and the leaders we have here, the citizens who are, are well informed about what needs to be done, we can make a difference by demanding that our leaders at the at local level, at the state level, and at the national level, start to work together. And the jobs compact that I think, and the elements of that jobs compact have to come from uh, the coordination of efforts on the part of people in education, in business, labor, and in, in government. So let's talk about what's needed and how we might get there and where these jobs, where these high quality jobs might come from. I mentioned that we're getting about 97,000 or 96,000 jobs last uh, month, so let's say 100,000 jobs a month if you average it out over the last quarter. Uh, at that rate, if we stay at that rate, in uh, 2010, 
we are still going to be about 10 million jobs short. We need 200, to, to be specific, we need 208,000 jobs a month. But let's just say 200,000 jobs a month, be, every month between now and the end of 2020, to close this jobs gap, make up for the, the, the growth in the labor force, and be back where we were prior to this recession. That means we, we, we have not had that kind of growth. We had that kind of growth for several years during the Clinton administration. But we really have not had that kind of growth ever for that sustained period of time. And so that's why we need to do something much more aggressive and much more proactive to get there. But I believe we can get there. There are ways uh, that I think we can close this job deficit. And so I want to talk about some of the actions and where, some of the, where these jobs can come from and where at least my own estimates say are realistic, not only from an economic standpoint, but also from talking with business leaders, from talking with people at that Harvard Summit, the kind of commitments and the kind of efforts that I think business is poised to be ready to engage in if they are pushed in the right direction, if they are organized in a collective way, and if they can uh, have partners, maybe from places like uh, this university, and my university, and others that help to facilitate these kinds of things. Well, if we just depend on uh, sort of expected growth in uh, the economy, the GDP growth, we will get some jobs, there's no question about that. But it'll get us, if under optimistic circumstances, with historic rates of growth, we'll get about seven to eight uh, a million jobs that way. So that leaves us a big job, jobs deficit uh, to move forward. The best way in which we can make progress is something that is not just my idea, it's, it's everybody who's thought about it. And that is by addressing the built up, pent up demand for improving and repairing our infrastructure in the United States. Whether it's bridges, bridges, roads, canals, railroads, air transportation, or electronic uh, high technology communication and broadband and all of the, the modern forms of infrastructure that we are so far behind on. These have the best return on investment for creating high quality jobs of anything we could do by investing in the private sector. And so I believe we have to start there. And we need an infrastructure bank, and we need business and labor to start to putting their own resources behind this so that government can then do its part to provide uh, support for lowering the, the, the effective tax rate for infrastructure investment. There's no magical uh, rocket science on how to do this. There's experience in Britain, there's experience in other countries, there's experience at the state level on how to do some of these, build some of these pro processes. And if we do it jointly, then we can make sure that we apply standards so that these are high quality jobs. So I would start by urging that we get on with that task. Uh, the labor movement has already indicated its willingness to participate in this kind of effort, put some of its pension money behind it, the business community should follow. We can, I think over the next uh, uh, five to eight years, recapture up to two million uh, manufacturing jobs that have moved overseas. Why is that? Well, because businesses are now beginning to recognize the total cost, not just the labor cost savings, but the total cost of communication, the risks associated with being in China at the moment. I'm going to be going there next week to spend a week working on dispute resolution in China. Why? Well, there are a couple of words. Foxconn, Apple, others, that Honda, these organizations are scared because they don't have the capability of, of dealing with the labor unrest that's happening in that country. We're going to see more country, companies beginning to question those investments. And as the value of the Chinese currency finally begins to rise and, and uh, closes that gap with the US, there's an a, a open opportunity to bring jobs back, as General Electric has done, as General Motors has done as Ford has done and as many of our companies are now considering doing. That's going to require some new forms of working together, getting labor and management to say what, under what conditions can we bring them back and make those not only uh, good jobs but sustainable jobs in the United States. That requires dialogue, coordination, modern forms of bargaining, sharing information, using the interest-based processes to make process, progress. I believe there's also a future for manufacturing in this country that we're only beginning to exploit with the incubators and the innovation centers that we have in Kendall Square, 
and that the mayor has promoted in the <coughs> South Boston and that are springing up around the country. We do have the capability of building and generating the next set of technologies if we have the will to go from innovation and R&D and the incubators that, that bring the new ideas to the market to building then a manufacturing capacity and capability as part of that business plan. That's part of our job as educators, to make sure that when we teach the next generation of entrepreneurs, they're not just being taught about how to get venture capital, but how to build sustainable organizations. And I think that will help us bring back more jobs. We have seen the apprenticeship programs between unions and companies slide down by about 36% in the last decade. We need to rebuild apprenticeships. We need to take the, the strong evidence that there's very positive rates of return for companies that invest in training collectively by working with their unions at the industry or regional level, and big returns, $250,000 over a lifetime is the best estimate of what the returns to an apprenticeship uh, are for individuals. Those are more positive returns than we see for community colleges and, in, and for many college degrees, four years. And so we need to rebuild the apprenticeship programs and get companies and unions working together. The same with community college and training programs. We know how to make those work. People in this room, Barry has worked on this, and I'm sure others have as well. Community colleges are, are the best asset we have in the United States for building these so-called middle-skilled jobs. But they only work if they are linked to the employers. If the employers in the region, whether it's the North Carolina Research Triangle, whether it's Western Massachusetts, where we have some good examples of this, whether it's in my home state of Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, where there's a great program along these lines, in Cincinnati, there's a great healthcare uh, community college link. 1199, the service employees work very closely with community colleges in building uh, uh, career ladders for uh, entry-level employees to move to licensed practical nurses up to RNs and so on. We know how to do this, we just need the right uh, energy uh, behind these. And then finally, I would, I would say two other things. One is, if we're gonna address the issue of the problems of young people who are underemployed, who maybe didn't get the technical science, math, technology, engineering skills that are in demand today, then universities like Northeastern, where you have the co-op programs, where you have the internship programs, or our own uh, university that's now doing more at MIT on online learning. We need to provide second chance education for those <coughs> individuals who have the capability of picking up those technical skills and say to industry, if we, if we train them, you tell us what they need, we will educate and train them with all the modern online technologies and, and other tools that we have if you commit to hire them. That's part of a jobs compact. And then finally, if we deal with the state and local government jobs that we have destroyed in education. In my, uh, back to my home state of Wisconsin, sadly, I look at what has happened in that state on both the labor relations front and on the, the budgets for education. And I have met many of my family members are still there and their children are there and some of our, their grandchildren are working in the public sector. Some of them are teachers and they are so angry with their governor, with their state, with the labor movement, they're just angry at the institutions for failing to lead and failing to give them the kind of respect that they need. And so we are now 600,000 jobs in the public sector, at the state and local level, down, and we can rebuild those. If we take on these issues, that will add up to closing this job deficit with high quality jobs. But let me end with more than just the jobs. The, one of the reasons that we are not making progress in this area is we have no labor policy in this country. We have a labor department that is essentially silent on these issues, not because there aren't good people there. Some of my good friends are working there, they're working their tails off, or use other ways of describing it, but they just don't have a voice in the critical policy making processes that really matter. That's an American tragedy. We need a, a, a comprehensive look at our employment policy. Yes, we have to fix labor law, but we have to fix it in a modern way that gets the kind of collaborative approaches that Barry mentioned we're working hard to uh, achieve here in Massachusetts as the norm, not the exception in labor relations today. And there are some policies that can support that kind of effort. 
We need policies that promote firms to invest in their, their workforce, to <coughs> use what we call high road strategies to promote innovation, in, uh, new technologies, new product development, listening to their employees, investing in their employees, engaging them in the improvement process, and then <coughs> moving forward from there. And then finally, I think we can do some things in how we regulate the workplace to reward those firms that are way ahead in showing us how to improve safety and health and how to ensure that we, people are actually paid what they are they're promised uh, in their paychecks and put much, much more pressure on those laggard firms that aren't there. If we do this, that's going to require a new focus within uh, our government on how to move forward. I want to end with us. I've talked about what I think the business community needs to do to work together. I've talked about the need for fundamental changes in government policy. If we had more time, I would talk about the changes in labor relations that we need uh, and what unions need to do to modernize their approach. But I think we in the education community have a responsibility to provide leadership in this area. And I will start at home at the MIT Sloan School of Management which I love as an institution. It's been very good to me. MIT has been a stellar institution for the world and, and personally for myself uh, and for my family. So I, I, I speak with a, a great deal of affection for the place and a great deal of criticism. We have bought into this financialization model of the firm, just like every other major business school in the country. And we've got to change that. And so we're working now to really build a, a stronger <coughs> curriculum at MIT around how you build sustainable organizations that work for people and work for investors and work for our companies. And we need to bring more of the kinds of people reflected in the audience here into our campus as you are doing here at Northeastern. And make sure that we have the kind of dialogues that we're going to have here tonight to ask how do we make sure the next generation of entrepreneurs, of leaders in business, of, of, of managers, have the skills, the capabilities, and are, are, have the expectations that they will manage in a way that goes with a high road strategy to achieve both high levels of performance and profitability for their firm, but also good jobs with respect for their workforce. That's, I think, the challenge ahead of us. We have challenges here in the public sector where Barry and I will, will work to find an alternative to Wisconsin to make sure that we can do better for our children and in, in, in improving education. That's one sector, but we now need to take this across the board to all sectors in the economy. And so my final uh, comment is, it's not my problem, it's not the government's problem, it's not business's problem, it's not the labor movement's problem, it's all of our problem. We all share in being too passive, in not holding each other accountable, holding our institutions and our leaders accountable for addressing these issues. So if we're going to make progress, it's going to be by people like everyone in this room, regardless of what our particular occupation or, or vocation is at the moment, doing what we can to bring these ideas to bear in all of the forms that we interact with and, and expect our leaders